my mom calls me. I haven't heard from her in years and she calls me. She's like, and I just wanted to let you know, I don't want you. Stop looking for me. I'm not your mom. I looked at my phone and said, F you, you never were. Rolled down the window and tossed the phone out. As soon as my friend made this right turn, I look over, I just said like in a soft voice, F this, opened the door and jumped out. People call it nothingness, a void, I don't know what you call it. You don't see anything. And I just hear, let me reintroduce myself. I am God. Yes, I am real. Yes, angels are real. They're a gift from me. Want to meet them? I see certain words pop up in the air. So one of the words said loving. Just flies in the air. Another word flying in the air says caring. Then another all caps with exclamation points. Long suffering. That God would suffer for a long time until he knows that he loves everybody. My childhood was straight from the gate. It was rough. At six months old, my mom threw me in a dumpster. And I guess after that, I went to my grandma. She had a nervous breakdown. I was with her until I was about maybe four. Uh, then from that, I ended up going to some other family's house. And I was... Uh, called names for being overweight. So I always had like certain like weight issues and like insecurities. Like I knew at four years old, something wasn't right after preschool one day. Um, I was inside the house and I'm like, how come there's nobody here? I can really like look up to anybody here that like, like I feel love from. So that was my childhood. I got in trouble at school a lot. I acted out. I think maybe then it was more like ADHD related, but back then you don't really say, oh, you have ADHD. Nobody just diagnoses that stuff. This was a long time ago. So I would get in trouble. I would get beat at home a lot for the stuff I couldn't control, like in school, like talking while teachers talking, you get a referral, they call home, you go home and it's a wrap. We went to church like every Sunday a lot, sometimes even during the week. So I had my own opinions about God and what they're telling you to be like, be like God, be like Jesus. But yet we're going here all the time. We're going to this church place all the time, but you guys at home are not exactly the most loving guardians that I can have, right? So I had different opinions about God too. I started writing music to release my pain because... I mean, see, I was about nine or 10 when I started writing music. It kind of helped release because around eight, I started cutting myself. I really don't know how I got the right idea or how I got the idea to do something like that. So like I said, I just like want to get another outlet. So I started writing music. The family I lived with happened to see some music I had when I went to go visit my grandma on one of the weekends that I used to see her. And... They freaked out when they seen those lyrics because it was nothing good. It was just kind of like my diary, my inner truths, my life story. Oh, when they found the lyrics, they called my grandma, told her I didn't have to stay there anymore. So I never went back there. They brought a lot of my stuff that I had at their house and brought it to my grandma's. I never even went back to that house to live there after that. Um, so around this time, I was with my um couple more relatives. Meanwhile, everybody in the family is wondering like, where's Chris? Like, where's Chris? How's he doing? But yet nobody reaches out to help or nobody reaches out to say, is he okay? My, my opinion about that is I think every, it seemed like everybody in my family, except for me, had like mommy and daddy to comfort them. Right. So like they fall, they got mommy and daddy. I had nobody. I have me. That's who I have. And this God that I'm looking to wondering, you know, like, is this a true God? If this is a true God and I'm supposed to be like these people, I don't want to know this God. I was just all like messed up everywhere. Like, you know, suicidal, uh, depressed. I was like social anxiety. Everything was just, there's no point in being here. So in my early twenties, I just said, I'm out of here. I'm going to leave. Because I thought everybody else out there thought the same thing. My head is conditioned already to thinking everybody in the world is thinking the same thing about me that my family did. 
I went outside, I looked at the trains because I was so numb and depressed. I stood there like all day. I timed every train and every time that it came. So that way I know exactly which time of the day to go and I know exactly where to lay. So I was just going to lay there, let it take me out. So one day I'm arguing with one of my friends or whatever, having this conversation and, you know, I storm off, I leave and I'm walking literally close to this train tracks and I'm walking past them. And literally right when I'm there, I hear this honk. And my friend says, get in the car. So I'm like, damn, no, my plan's ruined. Get in their car. And they just took off driving. At the most ironic time, my mom calls me. I haven't heard from her in years. And she calls me. How does she get my number? I don't know. I answer. I didn't even know who it was. I answered the phone and she's like, yeah, this is Christopher. This is your mother. And I'm like, mom. And I'm like, how'd you get my number? She's like, your grandma gave it to me. She's like, and I just wanted to let you know, I, and this is another time she tells me, I don't want you. Stop looking for me. I'm not your mom. I don't want you. She said again, I'm not your mom. So I looked at my phone and said, F you, you never were. Rolled down the window and tossed the phone out. And I remember my, as soon as my friend made this right turn, I look over and I'm, I just said like in a soft voice, F this, and opened the door and jumped out. Boom. And then that's when I had, that's when my whole entire near-death experience happened. Literally like two experiences in one that happened. So like literally the first beginning of it, I'm literally seeing nothing. It's just pitch black with different, thinnest different colors. And people call it a nothingness, a void. I don't know what you call it. You don't see anything. So all I know is I get the sharp feeling right here. Like it's like lightning, lightning striking you right here. And I just hear, um, let me reintroduce myself. I am God. Yes, I am real. Yes, angels are real. They're a gift from me. Want to meet them? So I said, no. Because I didn't believe in him. So I was like, no. But at this time, I knew whatever was taught, whatever was hitting me, it was the most supreme. You knew it was what they call God. I just didn't know the real name. Could have been like Hector. Could have been Billy. But he would have been like, yes, I am Billy. Like, you know, that's what you know me as. I see certain words pop up in the air, kind of trying to like reintroduce himself as his... Like, as his personality. So, one of the words said loving. Just flies in the air. Another word flying in the air says caring. Then another, all caps with exclamation points, long suffering. So, I remember this word long suffering as a kid. But I understood what it means now. I think it just meant hell that God would suffer for a long time until he knows that he loves everybody. I felt like a kid or something, be like a kindergartner, because I, I kind of like felt him get down on one knee and give me a hug and squeeze me. But me, I'm like, wait, like, you're not supposed to do this to me. Like, I'm not perfect. Before this hug even happened, I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here. Like, I'm not perfect. But he kind of tells me, like, I want you now, like how you are, like mistakes and all. Like, I want you now. You don't have to go get perfect and then come back. I seen most people in their life reviews, they see life reviews, I mean, during their experiences. I did not. I seen just a projector screen pop up. And then one like video I seen was a picture of a video of a guy in a suit with a briefcase. And then I was like, I love him. Here's the other guy with a joint in his mouth and a skateboard just cruising on by. And he's like, I love him. And then here's a prostitute girl. and She's walking by. And he goes, I love her. And it was like all the same love. There wasn't like, I love him more than her because she's a prostitute. It wasn't nothing like that. I just seen, and then I looked and I seen like this like snake wrapped in chains. And it was like, I didn't even know what, deal what that was, but it was like literally wrapped and couldn't move. I think it was maybe like a sign for the devil or something because 
that thought I had in my head was like, but what about? And before I can be like, but what about the devil? You know, it was like I looked up and seen that snake. And he's like, don't worry about that. Okay. Yeah, so um, so after this, I remember asking, I'm like, wait, like, what if people think I'm crazy? Like, what am I supposed to do when I go back to Earth? And he goes, tell everyone that I love them. Then there's also something else he said later. He said, I will go to the end of the world so that everyone is with me. Those are the two quotes that stuck with me the most out of this whole entire thing. So, poof, I'm midair now. I see clouds. I, I There's no more nothingness. I see everything. I see the floor. I see the ground. I see everything. I'm in front of, I'm like literally above a church. Um, ironically, above a church. During this experience, I seen ambulances, the fire trucks. I seen a bunch of police and the friend I was with on the side. But before I even seen that, I um, the first thing I really seen is I was freaking out. I seen like the clouds and this big old like donut hole like this in one of the clouds with like a light. If I would have stepped into that, I would have definitely went completely all the way to the other side. And who knows if I would have came back or not. Well, there was a bunch of angels around me, like circling me. But there was two in particular that I noticed. So one of them was on this side. One of them was on this side. The one on my left side, I'm like, I look. And he goes, are you sure you want to go? Like with the sternest voice. So then he seemed kind of mean. He was like, it was scary. He had like kind of like a beetle shaped kind of face. Wings were like more wide. Like, why? And that's when I knew wings are real. I look, he was more of a creature-like thing, though. But then I look to my right. Here's, this dude is more human than anything. He's, they're both dudes, but you can tell this one's definitely, like, man-man. Huge, remind like, of the paper towel guy, the brawny guy. Or, like, or like Dan Connor from Roseanne. Yeah, so, he had on, like, brown slippers, blue jeans, red flannel shirt, Sleeves rolled up to his elbows and no facial hair and like brown curly hair. So I'm just looking. I'm like, whoa, this dude is huge. They were both like nine feet tall. This one's just in the softest voice. I'm thinking he's going to kill me because I've, I'm not used to other beings. I'm like, oh, I'm going to hell. I didn't read the Bible. I didn't. Well, I read the Bible. I didn't, you know, like go to church every Sunday. I'm going to burn like they told me in church. And he goes, you have so much to do for so many people. That's all he said. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> so they're like before that, they're I'm freaking out. I'm like, give me out, give me out. They're like, no, it's OK. It's OK. Like, we love you. You're going to be OK. So they calm me down. So they told me to look down at the floor. So I look down and they're and they're like, no, you need to look down again. This time it's like a camera zooming in down to the ground. Here's like the, the fire trucks, the more cops than anything, though. But the cops right here. Here's the friend I was with way over here on the phone. And then here's my body laid out. And they're like trying to like, I guess, resuscitate me or whatever. And they're like, yeah, you need to realize this stuff really does happen. I see my body laying there. I'm like, how is it that I'm here but then I'm there at the same time. That doesn't make sense. So that's when I knew we literally have spirits. There's something outside of this life. So they asked me after that, they're like, so do you want to stay or do you want to go? So they actually left me the choice. Like, do I want to go with them or stay here? Me thinking about, oh, you have so much to do for so many people. Me being suicidal as it was, I'm like, you, first thought you think like, oh, I'm out of here, man here man but that urge was like no go back go back go back you got to help people you got a lot of people to help like a lot of people don't know god loves them so i don't know i just went i decided i should go back that's all i remember days later i woke up in the hospital the doctors are there and i'm like wait what happened they kept calling me miracle and all this it wasn't until because i was in the hospital for about a week almost a week I couldn't walk. I couldn't really talk anything. All my senses were shot. Like, couldn't smell nothing. So, 
being wheelchaired out the hospital, I remember looking up at the sky. It was a sunny day. I seen the mountains. I seen the horizon. And then I knew something happened. And then I looked on the concrete. And then that's when it all, boom, that whole boom came back to me. And that's when I realized something happened. And I knew I didn't have to be scared of it anymore or something. It seemed like I knew of a God years ago that know that a lot of people don't know about. It seemed different than the God that I that I've experienced. I can't say met because I didn't see his face. I didn't see, and I try to tell this during my ND, I didn't see his face, anything like that. You just felt it. Angels, you seen everything. I probably would have died if I seen his face, like for sure. Yeah, it was that powerful. So I know there's a reason I didn't see him. Or it, because it could have been like it, it, him, her. It's just, it has like so much love in both. You just macho woman. It's both like in one. It's hard to explain. You come back, you recover. What changed for you after? What changed in your life? Everything. Um, the way I think about life, I don't have like social anxiety anymore because I, well, sort of, but you can't really believe it because I'll be on stage talking to like massive people and I'm like, yeah, making them laugh. But deep inside, I'm shivering. Like I'm shaking. But I think I'm ex more accepting of it now. I'm more accepting of knowing that there's something out there. I don't have to be scared of death anymore. So now I feel like we're limitless. Um, animals, I used to see them as just like, oh, animals, they're animals. They're here to just be animals. Then they die. They don't exist after that. This like NDA is like, no, like animals are legit things. Like they have actual feelings. They have like, they actually laugh. They cry like we do. Like they want to be loved like we do. They get mad. They're, you know. All kinds of stuff. And that's when I started seeing, I'm like, everybody said dogs don't have souls. And I'm like, after that, I'm like, I think they definitely do have souls. But I don't care what anybody says. I think they have souls. Plants, even plants. I know plants are alive. There's so much. I became like the biggest nature person. I was a nature person before that, but I had no idea what like a nature person was. Let's not pollution. Like, let's not try to pollute the earth. Let's take care of the earth. So much different things. I understand people more. I look more at their inside, their souls to determine, you know, how they're. It's, it's like you look more in the inside, not the outside. Before this experience, I did so many jobs. Like I worked at the mall or this place, that place, uh, landscaping, all types of different stuff. But the NDE, it just made me want to change fields. And I ended up like, I'm like, I want to work with the kids because I love the kids. They've Ever since I was a kid, I've always felt a need to take care of kids. So I was a crossing guard for the school district. And I don't know, after that, I seen like the special ed buses and I was like, I want to be with them. Like, that's where I need to be. Cause it seemed like we were just so in sync with each other. Like I understood them and they understood me. So like they can conversate, they can have like a conversation with me and I know what they're saying without actually saying it. Cause I think they're a lot closer to God than a lot of the quote unquote normal kids. So after that, I just applied, you know, for the special ed positions and that's how it happened. And I've been with special ed since. A lot of people ask me, like, do I still hate my mom? Do I hate her? I'm like, no, I don't hate her. If I could, if I ever seen her, I would talk to her. I would want to, I would want to talk to her like adult to adult, like end up happening where it didn't happen like that. I was honestly on the verge of trying to go look for her and months within months later i get a message from someone and they told me i need to reach out to one of my aunts or someone else because my mom passed away so they found her um like on a sidewalk um she was homeless i mean she that's how she lived she was homeless she's always been like that from place to place never wanted to have her own place even when she had like a cell phone and stuff like that, 
like she used to call on pay phones, so nobody knew where she was. She liked to rather be on the street. So she died, uh, passed away. And um, I felt like that, like a lot of that changed a lot of stuff inside me after that. Um, I felt a little like, I guess, like discouraged because I didn't get to see her before she, and I didn't get to make that amends, you know, to let her know I knew you had some mental issues going. I don't hate you. So it kind of like, even right now, I think like, I really hope that she knows, like, like, I don't hate her. I was young. Of course I did. I was young. I didn't know. And, you know, um, so I guess from word has it, from what I hear, the family didn't want anything to do with her. They told her she has a son. He can handle that. Cause no one really, from what I know, no one in my family really reached out or cared much for her to even reach out to see how she's doing. So obviously she passed away there and these are her sisters. They're not going to, and her brother, they're not going to want to deal with her. So, Hey, she has a son, let him handle it. So me feeling the way I feel like, I'm like, wait, why would this come on me? This is not my son. She left me. Literally 10 minutes later, I broke down, cried, and a lot, and decided to make sure that she didn't leave me completely. So I took responsibility for her transition. I, um, I got her cremated, and I have her. So, like, now she left me, but she's with me right now. Hey, I had a dream about her a few, like, maybe two days after she passed away. And there was this picture I had, and I was little, young, young, young. And it was a picture of me and her from when I was little, and I cut it in half and just kept my side and cut her out in this dream. That same picture came and it was angle and I seen her. And it clucked. And I met her and I ended up helping her move. In this dream, I was helping her move into a new house. So I was literally like coming over, helping her move. Could have been like her heavenly house. I don't know. But like I was helping her move into her place. And we had the most fun. We had a ball. We had the best time. That was my best friend. Like, in that dream, like, slap fives, like, best friend, like, all right, girl, I'll see you later. Like, that's how it was. Okay, so I want to start off by saying, first and foremost, because some people get these interviews wrong about the fact that I had a, I guess, sort of beautiful near-death experience. I'm not promoting suicide in any way, shape, or form. What I'm promoting is you staying here and realizing that there's other things out there there's another being out there that loves you. There's other beings out there that loves you. It's a spiritual world. There's someone out there that you know personally. All you got to do is reach out and touch or call them or something. They're out there. That's all I need to say. Someone loves you, whatever you're going through. It was so amazing to speak to Chris. He's done lots of interviews, but hadn't done any since his mom passed away. And I found what he said about his dream with her so powerful. So thank you, Chris. My name is Lauren, and if you liked this video, make sure you subscribe to TNH Afterlife. I can't wait to share more near-death experience stories that can change your perspective on life and death.